did anyone rewrite their essay after I extended the due date? I rewrote part of it and changed my argument because my um, my first thesis um, kind of conflicted with the message that the song had. So I had to kind of change it and rewrite um, my last two paragraphs. Yeah, super important to make sure that you get like a, a solid argument that you can really develop out enough. So that was good. Um, yeah, I only had a couple students come to the office hour, but those who did, I think, really got got some good stuff out of it. And then the ad analysis, only one student came to that, but for some reason a- afterwards, whatever they turned in got like a perfect score on it. So it wasn't because they showed up and I was like, they showed up, I'm going to give them a perfect score. It was because they, they knew exactly what they needed to do and they did it right. And I think it had to do a little bit with that. So always feel welcome to come to the office hour, especially if you feel like the least bit confused about the prompt. Just to kind of segue out of that, I, I want to look at one more song and then we will start talking a little bit about any questions you might have about the essay 2 prompt. So I've only glanced at your essays for the song analysis. So this might not be you at all. I'm just saying if there is any issue, it's because uh, some people's claims aren't specific enough so that they, they don't really get far enough into it. Like maybe they're just fully in agreement with the song, which I warned you guys about that. Anytime you do that, if you're agreeing with the song, then that means the chances of you just staying on the surface of the song and only explaining what the song is already saying, it's a higher likelihood of that. So that's one of the major problems when you when you just agree with the song because you're not going deeper with it. So the issue is not being able to get to a deeper analysis of what is really going on with the song. So let's say this song, what's this song about? Anybody? Someone's heart being broken or maybe being sad. Okay, what else? Or anyone else agree? So it's like a breakup song. Or someone maybe like making a mistake or in the choir it says you don't have to say just what you did. Ah, uh, like, yes. I you know, like being shame or something and the other person is telling them like, oh, you don't have to like give explanations of what you did. I don't know. Well, so there, this one's a little bit more angry, I think. Like, I know what you did. Like, if you look at it in context, you've got a little bit of background story. So I found you when your heart was broken. I, you know, I took you in, I helped you. I pretty much just like poured everything into you and said, F everybody else, just put you back on your feet. Literally, she's saying that, right? Then what happens? Oh, the other person took advantage of them. Ah, yes. So far, we are only just understanding that this is... This is what this other person is telling us. This is what they they want us to know about the story, but think about it. You're only getting one side of the story. So you only have one side of the story to work with in the lyrics. It's whatever the artist or whoever wrote the song wants you to think. So is there any problem here that you find? So if you just went to this song to try and analyze it, if you just said, oh, this is a breakup song, and it's like a cautionary tale. You know, the message is to avoid this kind of heartbreak and toxic relationships or something like that. You're still only scratching the surface. In fact, you're only saying what she's already said. Is there anything else that we can get out of this song? So we're talking about songs right now, but we'll be, we'll be looking at news articles and and all kinds of current events and things like that, issues, global issues. And you should never trust what anyone tells you up front because it's only what makes them look good. You're supposed to look for the things where there's inconsistencies and slip ups. So how about her reaction? Anything there? Is there anything that, that is off-putting to you that, that sounds weird? Well, in the, in the first two, you know, um, parts of the song, it's seeing how she put him back on his feet. But um, going to the other side where it says, just running from the demons in your mind, then I took your, yours and made him mine. 
it's like all the other person's problems she made in hers as well mm -hmm. and uh whatever they had gone through like like she took on that burden right well that's still her side of the story that's but that's there right so she she's making sure to uh to lay that that narrative out for you is there anything that is inconsistent with that narrative or makes you feel that maybe there's a problem on her end with the way that she's thinking about things what do you guys think about this lyric right here i think he's trying to say that it's totally fine if we split, uh, split the part it's trying to comfort okay so halsey is okay with this you're saying yeah you don't sense any bitterness i think it's more like how she helped him out and now he can't go without her like like dude i helped you out you can't go without me like you think you could live without me i'm the one who put you back on your feet like i helped you so much mm -hmm. so you guys tell me do you think if you were in a relationship with someone and they said this to you, would you feel happy about that or would you feel something else? If someone said, you think you could live without me? What kind of relationship does that feel like from that person? Do you feel loved or do you feel something else? Something else. Yeah, what's that other thing? Do you feel obligation? Do you feel controlled? I think it's controlled. It kind of sounds like she feels that if she helped someone out, which, you know, maybe all this is true. But even if all of this is true, do you feel like that entitles someone to say this? You think you could live without me? Like, how dare you try to live without me after all that I've done for you? That's, okay, let's say it's not a girl saying that. Let's say it's a guy. Let's say it's a guy who's, who's maybe like paid her bills or done all these things. If she feels controlled or manipulated or, or just oppressed in the relationship, should she feel obligated to stay in the relationship or should she be able to leave the relationship and not feel like she's in a prison. Uh, she should be able to leave. Right? Now, we, we don't know the other side of the story at all, but this is what I'm talking about. So if you just paint the picture of her being like, uh, of just totally taking her side with this, and you don't catch this kind of thing, this is weird. Think about it in a relationship kind of setting. Even if you've never been in a relationship, if you see this kind of dynamic, it's reminiscent of the Bruno Mars relationship where he says, lucky for you, that's what I like. Remember that? So in this scenario, even if she said the song is about G-Eazy -E and he used her and then left, you know, used her to get some status or something, you know, she can give a, that context. That's not what you're working with. You're working with what's given here. And so far, whether the relationship is toxic on his end, you also see this toxic mentality, don't you? Is this not toxic to, to now obligate someone? Because when you're in a loving relationship, should anything be forced? Should there be like guilt that is like the major factor? Or has anyone here known people that were in relationships where because someone else has done so much for them, they feel that the other person is obligated to stay or to perform in a certain way for them. Did you ever think that that was incorrect? Or do you think that that is an acceptable way to think? I mean, is that love? Or at that point, you, you're not sure if the person did all those things for that person for a loving reason or because then they could hold it over them later on. Kind of creepy especially with how many people will like cover this song and how many people kind of feel vindicated in thinking this way. So if you are going to make a claim about a song 
like this, you, you kind of have to dig for those pieces. And then once you do that, once you see that, that the person's mask is slipping a little bit, now you can develop an analysis that points to something more like a message that the person is trying to put forward, but it ends up actually putting forward. If she's saying avoid toxic relationships like this, and yet she is showing you the mentality of a toxic relationship in her own thoughts on the matter and the way that she looks at the person and is accusing them, doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose or make it worse? Because meanwhile, the person who feels justified as the victim in the relationship ends up being just as guilty or, or maybe more, depending on the scenario. See how you get a lot more to talk about that way? I don't know if I've said this already, but have you guys noticed that, that you or anyone else you know, you'll watch a TV show and you'll kind of associate yourself with the protagonist or the, the main character? Yeah, you're... You're not rooting for the villain. So <laughs> that's because we tend to always put ourselves in the perspective of the hero or the victim. But are we either of those? When do you put yourself in the perspective of, or when are you realizing that you're actually the villain? Most people are like, will always try and force their position in the relationship to being a hero or a victim. That's it. Someone who is benevolent, someone who is doing good, or someone who is being wronged. And they will rarely see themselves as what is probably more true as also a villain. Everyone can be villains, by the way. That person can also be a villain. But the whole point is, if we're not able to see our own wrong, that, that creates this really weird ego, self-consumed perspective that ends up treating people like crap or holding them to standards, guilt tripping them in relationships, stuff like that. Um, just a horrible, horrible situation. And I don't know if any of you guys like that song, but I know there is a bunch of people who like that. So that's disturbing. Doesn't matter if it's catchy sounding. That lyric is repeated over and over and over in the song. Thinking you could live without me. Like, how dare you, right? So, okay. That's just one aspect that I'm talking about that we need to uh, make sure that we are doing. You shouldn't be trusting anyone fully. Like don't blindly trust what anyone is saying, especially not influencers, because there is always going to be a motive and the motive is always going to be selfish. That includes influencers, but it also includes politicians, corporations, anyone who is making an argument, even me. This is an argument to justify my own philosophies, which you are unaware of yet. Potentially, right? Or I'm just trying to show you another perspective that I see people missing. Which you, you need to be able to look from not only the, the perspective that you've been looking from, but also the other perspectives that you can so that you can get a better analysis. You can, you can understand the situation better, which now just beating a dead horse. Any other questions about that? How do you guys feel about that? Do you disagree with me vehemently? Or do you see what I'm saying? At least a little bit. Or do you want to talk about the SA2 prompt? Or is everyone just eating cereal right now? So no questions about the SA2 prompt. You guys are good on that. Can we go over it a little, please? Yeah, what do you, what do you want to go over? Um, All right, so we've got the prompt here. This is really it. These are the directions. I mean, this is what you need to do in it. And then to, to figure out exactly how specific you need to go and what topic you can actually cover, that's what we're going to be working out in class for a couple weeks. But you might already be able to figure out what you want to do today which I, I hope you do, it should be easy enough so long as you 
you have things that you're interested in, if that makes sense. Well, it, it will make sense. So for, for this, we are like supporting the fact about the topic that we're choosing. We're supporting it and showing that it's true in a sense or true or false. You don't have to prove something right. You can prove something wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Proves or disproves, or you can just complicate it more, right? Say, no, it's not quite true because of this. But then when you're complicating it, it's not that you're saying it's true or false. You're saying that's not quite accurate. It's not fully that. It is slightly that, but it's also this too. And then you're still proving something about it. If we were to um, complicate it, would that make us seem like we're contradicting ourselves? No. So you're complicating what someone else's claims are, not yours. Your claims are very clear. Your oh. claims are, many people have said this. This is a popular idea. I wouldn't say that it's completely false. I would say that there is, these parts are true and these parts are false, right? Something like that. Have we talked about the three ways of responding yet? I have some videos up already, but I don't think I had made them mandatory to watch. I think I just made them available. The three ways to respond to anything. This is your three options always. Have we talked about these? I don't think so. I'm not sure though. Okay. Think about it like this. So everything that you say, everything that you have an opinion about is a reaction. Everything. So when you write, you're always reacting to something. There's always a context. You're in a conversation. That includes academia. That includes current events. Anything like that, you are reacting to it and you have three ways of reacting. So in your essay, from this point on, you're gonna be dealing with things that you can either do one of these three things with, and that is either, yeah, you might wanna be taking notes on this. So you either agree or you disagree, or you do both. Those are your three options always. So when you agree, just like with the song, if you're going to agree, you can't just say, I agree, and state the same exact thing that they stated. There is no reason to come into a conversation and repeat something that someone in that group already said. There's no reason to write an essay like that. I mean, you could just be like, true, in the conversation. But, but you're writing an essay, and if you went on for like five pages just saying the exact same thing someone else said, there's no point to that. You're not adding anything new. So if you're going to agree, you always have to agree with a difference. So that's super important. So by difference, we mean there's, there's multiple ways. Maybe you take it and apply what they're saying to something else. Maybe you are bringing some new information, like let's say the thing that you're having to engage with is from 2007, and since then there have been a lot of advancements, a lot of new information that's come out, and it still agrees, but that person is only dealing with stuff that's from 2007 and back. So now you can write in agreement with what that person said, but add all that new information to it. So if you agree, always make sure there's something to add. Otherwise, you're just plagiarizing. <laughs> Disagree. Disagreeing is pretty easy. Just think about any conversation you've had with your parents uh, when they want you to do something that you don't want to do. should clarify that. So if you disagree, you need to explain why. You can't just say, nope. And you definitely can't just say facts or science. Like you can't say the word facts or the word science. You have to actually not only disagree, but state how you are disagreeing. How is that person wrong? How are their claims wrong in particular? And then of course, support those claims. And then finally, you can do both, which is what we kind of talked about with the complicating it. And by definitively, I mean like you are truly complicating the matter. You are 
you are proving that the matter is more complicated than the flat way that that person portrayed it. Like that side isn't fully true, that there's all these other intricate parts that actually make it so that their claims are only half true. And so you would, you would agree with parts of their claims or with the initial idea that they came up with, the ideal, but then the practical application of it you may disagree with. Or there's these other components to the argument where, where it's just not that broad and it needs to be more narrowed down. It's, it's only true in a very specific way. And so in this case, you are then doing both. You are agreeing and disagreeing without contradicting yourself. It is very important that you remember that you're trying to not contradict yourself. You're contradicting them, but you're, you're also explaining the difference between what they think about it, what their claims are, and what your claims are. And when you do that, it shows that you're contradicting them, but you're not contradicting yourself. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Cool. So that's a huge part of it, and we're doing it with whatever subject, with whatever specific topic you guys want to use. So you could just focus on fraudulent claims in a single news article, so long as it's, it's like a popular one, right? It's not just some like mom's blog where like no one was reading it anyway, or, or her ideas were, are made popular by someone else who is more popular. Like try to focus with something more mainstream that is influencing people. So you could, you could do that, something that's been passed around social media that's been incredibly misleading. You can go with that too. Maybe, maybe something that people have taken off Facebook, right? Facebook has been censoring a lot lately, Facebook and YouTube. Maybe there was something on there that you think is actually the truth and they're trying to hide the truth. And there could be tons of reasons for that. Like maybe it's a conspiracy where they're trying to control the masses, or maybe they're just trying to make sure that there's not havoc in the streets. So maybe they're trying to keep order by keeping information censored. But that goes into motive, and that's, that's harder to prove. But maybe there is something on Facebook. Maybe there is something on some, kind, some social media site that has been censored that you actually think is true. And so you could argue that to be true, but you need to really find good sources for that. That stuff tends to be taken down because whatever they're using for their source is not strong enough. Maybe, or maybe it's a global conspiracy and they're trying to control our brains. So uh, my tinfoil hat's way over there. So I, I, don't, I can't really go there right now, I guess. So this is like a step-by-step -step kind of thing. You like make sure you do this. These are just some options here of things you can use, but you can use pretty much anything. You just wanna cover it with me. Here's, here's some general topics. Topics that won't work. So you can't prove the existence of God. There's no way to do that. There's also no way to disprove the existence of God. So if we're doing a argument of fact essay, you can't really do that because there's no way to do that. So that's why that one's off limits. Also, global warming. I don't want to read another global warming essay or an obesity essay. That's why. Anything that, that ventures into right or wrong, good or bad, remember I put up that. So anything that was in the green on that image you were able to use, and then anything that goes into the red of policy or value you need to avoid. Now it could be something that could go into value and could go into policy, but you are only limiting yourself to an argument of fact with it that's fine, but some things just aren't going to be able to give you enough to talk about if you, if you stick there. So we're going to try and figure it out and make sure that you guys pick something good. Pick something that is going to make life easier on you, not harder. Five pages this time. You'll need five pages. When I say at least, at least four sources, I mean at least. Like you will, depending on the essay you write, depending on the arguments you're making, you may need only four sources, but maybe you'll need 10. Some students have used 10, and it all depends on what you're trying to make an argument about. We'll cover a little bit more of that in, um, in Professor? 
Yeah. I'm kind of confused with the due dates of um, um, uh, oh. everything. Oh, look, I yeah, this is wrong here, clearly, right? So that's the only due date that's wrong. That's what you were talking about? Yeah, so the final draft, it's due October still. 31st. You guys see that up there? Yeah. All right, so yeah, if you have it printed out, which you should, you should write that in on there, but you can always look at the schedule. Did everyone print out or at least download the new schedule? Yeah. Cool. All right, same place as the old schedule was. Thanks for pointing that out, by the way, Zach. Yeah, so, no problem. Yeah. Fallacies. So quiz instead. You'll notice on that course outline that it'll say a quiz instead of the meme assignment. Um, so that, just make sure you do that by the end of Tuesday night, and that's all covered in that video. All right, so some other possible topics, things to work with. You can even make claims like this. Everything is an advertisement. Do we kind of talk about that already? Even songs, they're advertising something. They're pushing something. They're trying to make you buy an idea. I was wronged in a relationship. How dare they think they could live without me? Everyone is a narcissist. Wow, kind of sounds like Halsey's a narcissist, but maybe not everyone. See, anytime we say everything, everyone, that's an absolute statement. So that does make it difficult to make that argument. However, there are ways to do it. So everyone is a drug addict. That's a good one. I love that one. Later on, when we get closer to when we're brainstorming over the essay, we're spending time in class doing a lot of that. I might verbally write that essay for you. That doesn't mean you can write that essay if I do it though. Let's see what else. Corporations completely run our country. Well, that that's kind of obvious, but I think you'd obviously have to prove it too. So yeah, we live in the Hunger Games. <laughs> nature versus nurture, that's gonna come up. That's an argument of fact. Is this thing nature or is it nurture? You can totally make an essay out of that. Uh, something is or isn't an addiction, is or isn't a real disease. Is alcoholism a disease? You could make an argument for or against that. So those are all kind of the same category right there. This one, I crossed it out because if you think about it, I don't think you can actually get a full solid essay out of this. You can contemplate it yourself, and if you feel like you can get five pages that are not fluff, and you really want to argue that virginity is a social construct or something like that, then you can, you can do that if you'd like, but you have to talk to me about it first, because I feel like that's only one or, or three paragraphs. That's not, not enough. Oh, this one's fun. So you can't prove or disprove God. But you can prove or disprove the validity of a holy book if you would like, if that's your bag, if you really enjoy that kind of thing. Remember, when you're testing something, you are internally testing it and externally testing it. Well, those are the best ways to do it. You should be doing that. So internally testing it. Does it contradict itself or does it agree with itself? You can look at a holy book like that. Does it contradict itself? Because if it does contradict itself, then that alone might disqualify it, <laughs> especially when it, if it claims to be the word of God. How can something be the word of God if it contradicts itself? Does that mean that God contradicts himself? Or is there a way to explain that away too? So, I mean, that could be something. But what about externally testing it? Well, does it match up with other things that we know are true? Or does what we already know to be true contradict it? like science or archaeology. So think about that. I'm trying to find things. I'm trying to give you guys examples, tangible examples of things that, that maybe will pique your interest. Either it's something that you're already interested in and you already know something about and so you really want to talk about it because it's already your passion. Or maybe you're really interested in that thing and you want to explore it more. This is the kind of thing that you're probably going to want to write about. Pull up the crap test, and uh, we, will, we will talk about the other side of that. Did you guys watch that video that wasn't mine on the crap test?
All right, so they already talked about the other side, the actual crap test. I'm gonna talk to you guys about research a little bit right now. So if you have it printed out, you can write notes on this. If you don't have it printed out, you should definitely take some notes on these things and then maybe transfer it to that or whatever, but you should definitely put the notes in your RLD notes. So, so yeah, let's, let's talk briefly about this. What do you think about Wikipedia, first off? You guys tell me, can you use Wikipedia? Not really. No. Okay. What do you mean by not really? Um, well, I'm like, there might be some things that might be true, but it's, I'm assuming like a small percentage of it since it's anyone can post anything on there. So not really. Okay. Oh, completely no there. <laughs> You're, you're on to the right track there. So the reason why we don't want you to use Wikipedia is because whoever we, we are unsure of whoever put that information up there. Now, Wikipedia is not quite like the Wild West anymore. There are, um, there are admin, there are uh, checks and balances in place where if someone tries to edit a page, it can end up getting locked or, or it has to be reviewed or they need to cite a source if they make a claim of fact. So there's a lot with Wikipedia that makes it actually good information, but the problem is the authority. The authority is not there. Remember the crap test? So if you guys watch that video on the crap test, uh, from that other school's library. They talk about, they use a, a, an example from Wikipedia and they walk you through. So anything that is said that is a claim of fact on Wikipedia should have a link to a, a resource that should be credible. So you can click on the link and it'll bring you all the way to the bottom or you can just scroll all the way to the bottom and check out the footnotes. So that's useful. The thing is you're never, like you said, Stephanie, you're never going to use Wikipedia in your essay as your own source. However, you can find sources through Wikipedia. You still have to put those sources through the crap test, but Wikipedia is actually a good tool for familiarizing yourself with a topic. The reason is, if you don't know anything about that topic yet, if you're just really ignorant to anything going on with it, you should do a Google search. You should search the, the topics, search something you know about the topic that you want to explore about it. And one of the first things that's going to come up is probably a Wikipedia page. You can click on that Wikipedia page and maybe you will find more key terms that will help you figure out exactly what you need to be searching about. So it doesn't mean you believe the information necessarily, but the chances of that information being good are higher than, than not. It's more likely that the information is roughly good, so you can use that information to help you go further in finding more specific things to, to research about on that topic. So you can go to Wikipedia, you can even go to ProCon websites, you will never use ProCon websites. You can even go to social media to try and see what people are arguing about. The only time you're gonna quote a social media post or something like that is if it's an example. You're never gonna use that infographic that you got off social media as your actual source. It can be an example, not the source. So I wanna talk a little bit more about sources. Why do you use a source? Like what, what do you use a source for? You've got two reasons why you would use a source. Two, you're arguing against what someone is saying. You're arguing for or against. Remember that agree, disagree, or both thing? You are using what someone has already said to put what you are saying into context for your reader. So either it's the person or it's the, the thing, but that's not something you're using for support. So you're either bringing it up as an example or as the, the, the context for the thing that you're talking about, which that does not count as one of your four sources ever. That doesn't count. What counts is the second reason you would use a source, which is you're not an expert. <laughs> you're not an expert on any of this stuff, which is fine. So you find an expert 
you don't have to be a credible source. You just have to represent credible sources properly. So that's what I mean by the sources that you need to use at the bottom of the requirements on the prompt. It's always going to be something that supports your claims. And understand this, this is a huge note. Put stars around it, highlight it, squiggly circle around it. It is important that what you use for support is not just someone else parroting what you have already said. You don't throw a quote in there just so that you can count it as one of your quotes when all they're doing is saying the thing that you wanted to say. When you bring in support, support is evidence. Here, what are the types of support? Let me tell you. These are types of support. So you've got facts, you know, regular facts and statistics, um, which obviously you need to make sure are credible, that they're not just on an infographic and someone is talking about, you know, uh, race, racial crimes and things like that, and they just throw it on this infographic and they pass it around social media. That's not what I'm talking about. You find authoritative statistics and you, you want to explain how they came to those statistics. So remember, this is how you get substance in your essay. Not only so you make a claim, you make a claim of fact that goes, so you have a claim of fact as your, as your thesis, but within that claim of fact, in order to prove it, you have smaller claims of fact that will all work together to, to support the larger claim of fact. So in those smaller ones, you need to support those. So what you do is you bring in evidence. So when you bring in a source, this is another thing that, that you, should, you should always make sure that you do. When you quote something, make sure you explain why it's credible. Don't, the only, the only time that you are going to explain or you're gonna start a quote with so-and-so says in their article blank. Anytime you're gonna do that, it's gonna be for the first reason why you quote something which is you are, you are engaging that as, as your context. Never with the thing that you're using for supporting your point do you need to really say so-and-so says in this work unless, it is, unless saying that on its own is enough to point to the credibility of that source. You guys get what I'm saying? So, so it's all about stating the credibility of the source before so why should i believe this source you want to tell me why i should believe it before you give me the information on it that only makes sense because the whole time that you're giving me this information i or anyone who's reading it is thinking yeah but why why should i believe this information where did you get it from say it first so that people can focus on what you're saying rather than on what you're not saying so it's all about the order, right? Make it a logical flow. If someone's gonna have a question about something, make sure you, you answer the question before, as much as you can, uh, before you, you give them the material that you know they're gonna have questions about. You qualify what you're saying. Um, the statistics, these statistics that are authoritative, you don't say that, you'd say, you know, uh, there's, a ton of data, you know, that points to this, my claim, or if you don't say my claim, you just say, uh, you make your claim, there's been plenty of studies that have been done to prove this, most, you know, specifically here, this study that was conducted on like 5,000 people, uh, random double blind test, you, you see what I'm saying? There's information that you're giving about the study uh, by a, I don't know, let's say, if you're talking, if the study is on a corporation, on something about a corporation's product, and the study was paid for by the corporation, does that give credibility to the study? Or does that take away credibility from the study? Okay, so if a corporation has a study done, why would they do that? 
like a corporation who has a product, they have a study done on their product. What do they want their, their, their product to look like in the outcome? They want their product to look good. So the chances of that being tampered with are higher in probability. Now, if we say that the study is done by a third party, that's credible, that's, that's giving credibility to it. Now, you don't wanna lie. You also don't wanna use a study that has been done by the company itself. Also, maybe you use this as an argument in your essay. Maybe you're fighting statistics that someone else has put out. Those statistics are, are from a study that was done by the company themselves. That's a thing. <laughs> so that's, it, it works both ways. If you're agreeing with or disagreeing with something, you want to, you want to back up your claims, but you also want to be able to pick up, or sorry, pick apart the claims that you're fighting against like that. The statistics don't just stand as you can't argue against this. How are they applied? How, how were these numbers figured out? There's a lot going on with statistics where you can just, you can manipulate the numbers. And so if you can figure out how the numbers were, were figured, you can figure out if they were done non-biasly or, uh, or if there was some other purpose in it. So when you bring in a source, what's the credibility of the source? And then when you talk about the, the information from the source, like the facts, or statistics or whatever, you wanna say how they were figured out. And so if your source doesn't do that, chances are it's not the best source for it. But maybe that source points you to, it, it tells you what the name of the study is. That means you go and you find the study. Like don't be lazy and just go with the first source that's just talking about another source. You want to, oh, you're talking about this other source, I'll just go and look at that other source. The only reason why it will be acceptable for you to use a source that's talking about another source is if you're unable to get to that other source. But if you do this, I'm gonna check your work and I'm gonna see if you can get to that other source. So just make sure that you are not getting third, fourth party information like three or four times removed from the original. That's ridiculous and unnecessary. So there's, a, there's another resource that you guys will have up here. You've got the school library database. Do you guys know that? So if you click on this link, which is in the uh, writing tools, so you can either click on it from here, if you have it open as a PDF, you just hit control and, and your mouse, and you should be able to open that, that tab up. And you can go through workshops where the library actually leads you in figuring out how to use the databases, how to do research. And you can do, there's all kinds of workshops in there. So if you don't already know how to do it, I would encourage you to do that. However, you can find some pretty good sources just from Google alone, but you, you need to hunt a little bit more for them. Sometimes you may hit a paywall if it's like a scholarly, if it's like a journal or a database of some kind that, that you're led to through Google or Google Scholar. But if it does, make it so that you have to type in credentials. You may be able to type in your, your actual school credentials. Your, your portal login might be able to get you in through there. And if it doesn't, then you can always now look for that resource from Google. So you just type in the paper name or the, the author of it into the library database search. And then maybe since you're already logged in through the library, you'll be able to access it that way. So try and Try and do what you can to navigate. That's, that's what you're pretty much working with. Also, any time when I'm talking right now, you can interject and say, wait, 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 I'm a little confused on this. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep talking. <laughs> but I am totally cool with you guys jumping in and saying, hold on, could you explain a little bit more about that? So yeah, types of support. We talked about facts. Uh, we talked, so historical accounts and legal precedents. So that's what's in, right? This is what's in the courts right there, or historical accounts. So this stuff is, you really need to make sure that it's an authority and that they are, there's documentation. You wanna make sure, like don't just pull it out of a textbook. Surprisingly, textbooks don't give, a lot of the time they don't give an actual resource. They just 
expect you to believe what they are saying is true. Um, we will talk about why that's acceptable for them, but not for you, or only sometimes for you. We'll talk about that in a second. You also have expert opinion, once again, heavily relying on what that person's expertise is. So if that person is an expert and they are, so the reason why you would give expert opinion is because there are no facts on the matter. And so you can only leave it up to an expert on what they think, what they would assume with their wealth of knowledge on the topic could be the results of something that we don't have any statistics about yet, which there are quite a few things that we, that we don't know. We don't know enough yet. Um, so that's why you may bring that in, uh, bring in a scholar instead of like hard data. Um, testimony, eyewitness, news reports. So all of that stuff, that's, that's useful, but just remember, um, one account, if you just, this is the reason why you're probably, if you, if you talk about personal experience, you're going to keep that to a minimum. You actually don't want to bring your own personal experience into a paper very much. It doesn't actually help prove your point very well. Because just because you've experienced something or just because one person has experienced something, it doesn't mean everyone's experienced that. And even if you bring up your, your eyewitness account, there's someone else who could bring up an eyewitness account of the exact opposite kind. And who's to tell if you should be believed or they should believe? And that's the problem with anecdotal evidence. When someone says, oh yeah, well this happened to me, and then they spread it around and expect it to be true for everyone. That's not necessarily true. Now, so, so even with journalistic reporting, when they get eyewitness uh, information, they need to get at least three eyewitnesses. Even in a court of law, you need the testimony of two or more. So this, because people are biased and people have, Issues we already talked, or I talked about in that first video you were supposed to watch, where your own senses are so misleading sometimes that it's very difficult to trust them. And then yet in the court of law, we have to actually trust them. So you need more people to have experienced the same thing. Now, so this is, this is where you can use and why you would use your own experience. Your experience gives a close-up or someone else's experience gives a close-up of a scenario. Now, it's still just one account, but you, it helps your reader, it builds, pathos is still good. It's still useful, it's still compelling, but you can't be depending solely on pathos. So if you bring something up, it's okay to bring up a personal experience, but then if you want to actually prove that point, if you want someone to believe it, then you would also want to bring up statistics that back it up and say, sure, this is just one account, but look at the statistics. The statistics actually say that this is what the majority of people deal with or the majority of people in this ethnic group or in this uh, local area or whatever it is within this demographic. So you, you see how you want to put it together with something else that is going to be more compelling. So then you've got, you've got a close up of it, of the scenario for your reader to be able to visualize and to really make them feel the issue that's at hand. And then you give them statistics to help, to help them understand that it's not just a one-time thing. So try not to bring in your own personal experience unless you're going to be able to back it up with a larger, uh, a larger data set, yeah? Um, and you can, you can totally do that. That's, students do that all the time and it works. Uh, it, it makes your argument stronger to put those together. This last bit, this is why, so, so this is super important for you to be able to assess. So not only are there these types of support, not only are there these, these ways, so these ways to, 
to research and and the how you would use it what you would actually use research for but then there's also deciding the quality of your support and the need for support so think about this is the source so once again crap test trustworthy credible reliable accurate details though so make sure they give you enough details of of the things right like i said if they just tell you statistics blindly but then they they don't tell you how those statistics were were figured out you need to go and find that out if you want to use it because if you just say these are the stats but those stats could be from a bias company from a bias source and they don't maybe the study was done poorly then it could be misleading incredibly misleading um, so you need to be able to know that it's a trustworthy statistical source um, and you need to be able to show us you don't have to drag it on forever but you do need to say that stuff it could be it, it could all be in like the first the sentence right before it should be enough um, and then obviously the accuracy of it uh, as best you can tell so this part though this is important I know it's it's not very pretty looking, but uh, this is a little bit of a spectrum. So textbooks, right? Some of the reason why they don't cite a source is because it's common knowledge information that can be found on many sources. So uh, once again, you deciding on what to use as a source is not just crap, I have to make, I have to have four sources here, so I'm just gonna find a source for anything. For anything that I can, no, you, you need sources to back up. You need strong enough claims, and then you need those, since those claims are so strong, you have to be able to back those up. This is how you make a real essay that goes far enough, that gives you enough to work with to need five pages to prove it. So when you go through the, uh, the idea of, do I need to prove this? So is it already realistic? Is it already believable? If what you are saying as your claim, which sometimes you have to do this, you, you have to do this quite a bit, is make claims that are obvious, like to build up to stronger claims. So you're starting with information that you are assuming is fact because we already know that it's fact. So you don't need to explain gravity. You don't need a source on that, that definitively proves that we have gravity. Uh, that is already something that is common knowledge. You don't have to have a source for that. Don't waste that source. I won't count it as a source. So if it's realistic, you don't even need it. You don't even need a source if it's easy to believe, meaning it is not just something that's commonly spread around, but that it's actually something that we, we all know is fact. But if, it's, if it starts going further down this way on the spectrum, the further it gets towards mind-blowing, I, I think, I don't know which way it's directed for you guys, but yeah, the further it goes towards mind-blowing, the more sources or the stronger sources you need in order to back it up. So if I say everyone's a drug addict, well, then I'm going to need some pretty strong claims to back that up, or pretty strong evidence to back that up, uh, depending on how I'm arguing it, though. So uh, if it's harder to believe, right, it needs significant proof. Sometimes for that one claim you were making, like in your thesis statement, you might need 10 sources just to back that up, and you make smaller claims along the way to back that up. And so maybe... Maybe one, one claim you need three sources for. It's true. It could happen where you really need to like make sure without a shadow of doubt that your reader is on board with you and they're like, no, you have, okay, okay, I'm on board. I believe it. You proved it enough. I need, so sometimes you may need to do that. Sometimes you might, you may not need a source at all for it. So think about it. Is it easier to believe or harder to believe? depending on what we already know with common knowledge. And so a lot of times in the textbooks, they don't need a source. And then other times they do need sources and they just don't give them because they're like, we're the authority. 
which is pretty jacked up. So that's why you're not going to use textbooks to, you're not going to use textbooks as your source because they're not doing enough. Um, they might be able to point you to, to stuff to use though. And so you can talk to me about that if you need. Are we, uh -huh. sorry. No, go for it. We won't use them as a source, but we can quote from them and still like include it. Like if we were to add, um, I don't know, some type of idea or something that we might think like, oh, maybe this is kind of supporting it in a sense. So that's the thing. If it doesn't give you a source, if it doesn't explain how, like a textbook, don't use it. No. So if the textbook just has an idea that already agrees with what you're saying, like if you can already put it in your own words, and it's not something that you would really technically need to quote someone on because that information is everywhere. It's in textbooks. It's on like 10 different sources you can find online. It's common knowledge. You don't need a source for that. You don't need a source for an argument unless it's something you're arguing against, unless it's something that is giving you context. So maybe you're arguing against something in a textbook. You could use it for that case. You could say, well, this textbook says this, but that is actually false. And then you build your whole argument around proving that that's false. But you never want to use a source, like I was saying earlier, you never want to use a source to say something that you could say on your own. That is a waste of a source. That's, I do not count that as a source. So a textbook is generally not going to do you any favors with that they may bring up an argument that you do want to make, but you don't have to quote them for that if it's a common argument that anyone would make, that anyone could make. They don't own it. Are we all clear on that? Yes, thank you. Yeah. I'm really glad you asked, by the way, because that is something that students struggle the most with, figuring out what exactly is the kind of source that I want to be able to, or that I can use. Every student that I've had that has tried to use a textbook has had a miserable time with it. And that's why. And so I try to, I try to steer you guys away from things that are going to make life, make your assignments more difficult for you. All right. So the reading, what did you guys get out of the reading? Remember I gave you guys the crap test to work with mm -hmm. and the uh, fallacy arguments or the fallacies handout. Did you guys notice either of those things in either of these articles or, or something applicable to either of those in the articles or just some of the points? Does anyone have anything to say about this topic at all? Um, just some of my opinion after I read the article. Um, um, I think I think I kind of support uh, using GMO food because just for overall benefit. Well, what what's the overall benefit then? Well, like like how the the professor one of the professor mentioned in the article that. Um, GMO food actually helps reduce the food price and also reduce the usage of um, pesticide. Um, it, it, I think it's, it has more advantage um, than its potential harms. I mean, like overall, we have been using and eating uh, GMO foods for, for a couple of years. And I don't think, I, I mean, we don't have some like very obvious um, down, downside for people. So I think it's, I think it's, it's fine to use it so far. Yeah, just in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, well, so what, uh, what, what about you, the rest of you guys? Do you guys agree with that? Hold on. A lot of people with their cars around here. Um, did you guys hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what do you guys think about, uh, about that? Because Zach brings up some points that are definitely in here. Those are definitely things that were expressed in here. 
Do you guys agree? What? What do you think? Agree, disagree, or both? I I agree since um uh the world by you know feeding the hungry and and all that it's a pretty big thing going on um for many years so even though like Zach mentioned there may be more things pro than against even though it may have like its flaws or or something bad against it but there's a big factor on on like the hungry and if it helps in that i guess it's good so i support it in that okay i mean well if you're reading the article what is the guy the guy who is writing this article is he in support of gmo foods see in support of that industry guess that's a rhetorical question. The guy is in support. He is clearly in support. He is making an argument for. He does bring in one dude at the beginning who brings up a couple issues. So once again, how are you representing the opposition? Super important to make sure that you are representing the opposition correctly, that you are bringing their strongest arguments, their biggest concerns, and that you are adequately explaining how they are wrong or how they are answered, answering them in a way that you feel is sufficient enough. This guy is representing it in an interesting way. So first of all, Zach, you're right, GMO crops, all of that is for making food more available. Well, you can make more food, you can make it for cheaper because it can be more resilient to pests and weather. Those are the reasons why we make GMO crop. Well, that's, that's not the overall reasons for why we make it, but that is, that is the main argument for it. Do they make food more nutritious? Is it, better, is it making food better for us than the natural version of it? I mean, I think it's debatable. Is it? I mean, like... Give me it an example. On, I think it depends on how you genetically modify um, a brand of food. Because, like, I think there are several ways to do, do so. Um, I, and I think, I think our, our um, method are, are constantly evolving, in a sense. So I think, I, I think in the future, it might be, it could be more nutritious. But, I, I mean, currently... Um, based on the result uh, experiment, um, I think it's it's not particularly better. Correct. It's not. It's not better. But I think it's possible to be but better. It could be, but that is yeah. not what they're focusing on. That's the thing. There is an example that you will see, which they will give you the example of golden rice. Has anyone heard of golden rice? No. It is rice that has been genetically modified to have vitamin A in it, which uh, some people groups are heavily lacking in their diet. And mm -hmm. so they, they put vitamin A, or they, they've genetically engineered it to have vitamin A in it, which it doesn't normally have. Do we make golden rice? Is that something that people produce? Not naturally. Well, not naturally, but do they use this trademarked product, golden rice? Do they, do they produce this on a commercial level for the consumption of poor and malnourished peoples? No. They do not. They do not produce it, but they do have it as an example to say, look, we're doing it, but they're not actually doing it. They're not actually using it. And... But the majority of the things, the, the majority that are out there as products being developed agriculturally to feed people to be sold in stores are genetically modified to last in weather, to be bigger, to have a longer 
lifespan on the shelf. It's, it's all things to make more money off of it, but it's not concerned at all with how it's going to do in your body. Mm -hmm. And so the, we have the opposition brought up and the guy mentioned something that doesn't really get, I mean, I guess later in the article, he, he defends by citing several sources or, or, or by discounting several studies that were done on mice and things like that. How long do you think you need in order to tell if something's going to be bad for you? That it's going to affect you in, in some way? How long do you think you need? Oh, that's what we can take. Years. Go ahead. I think it has to be years, more than, more than five or 10 years. Yeah. How about, yeah. how about multiple? So you can make multiple generations of, fit, of crops pretty quickly in order to see how they develop genetically. And they, they do that in the labs. But what about the beings, the, the humans that are ingesting it? Five, 10 years? Okay. But that's, I mean, how, how do things work? We have generations and generations before we realize something has, let's say, made us infertile or has changed our genetic makeup like multiple generations. If it takes multiple generations to see that in plants, why wouldn't it also take multiple generations for humans? It's just that generations for humans are a lot further apart. So I wanna to stress to you that this is a, a significant concern that is not being taken into account because that is not practical for making money. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not practical for making money and for feeding the masses of starving people in the world. By the way, how many of them are actually eating these crops? Probably very few. Huh. Where are the starving people in the world? Do you guys know? Mostly concentrated in Africa or third world countries. Sure. It's, it's like this huge section here and then also Africa. Um, but lots of starving people. There's lots of countries. A lot of these countries have actually uh, refused to take GMO crops. They've just completely banned them in their countries. Why? Is it because they're afraid? Is it because of superstition? Could, could be. Okay. Do you guys know what's in, what some of the factors are that they have bred into the crops. Like, so we talked about longevity, uh, dur enduring weather and things like that. They've also bred into most of the crops infertility in that you cannot reproduce, you cannot take seed from the crops. That, so you buy seed from Monsanto or any of those ConAgra, any of those companies that have produced GMO crops, you buy GMO seed, you have the plant produce, and then you have seed from it. Seed is infertile. You have to keep going back to them for more. You are dependent upon that company every year for more. Mm -hmm. And so the argument from them is probably, you know, that this is, you know, it's a, it's a money-making thing, but that's the point. The very reason why you are saying that this thing is beneficial to the human race is the same thing that you're doing to stop it. Like you're not actually benefiting the human race, you're benefiting yourself. Um, and on top of that, we have no idea what those side effects could be three generations down the road. But that's not, he's, he's, not, he's not taking that argument he, he touches on other things like, but what are the effects now? What happens when we eat, or when lab rats eat this stuff or the butterflies? Has anyone seen the logo for the, the GMO project or non-GMO project? It's a, it's a monarch butterfly on a, like a little blade of grass. It's because the first time this, this was discussed with uh, BT corn, it was over a study that was done where it, it had, uh, they had come to the conclusion that the milkweed that the monarch butterflies 
eat almost exclusively for their diet was, uh, was being covered with the pollen of GM corn, sorry, of uh, B BT corn, which is GMO corn. And it was actually making it so that they wouldn't, uh, their offspring, the offspring of the, so the caterpillars were unable to develop to maturity, like a significant portion of them. And then the study, the study was redone and people were then, uh, who was the study redone by? So they, they argue that the study didn't have a big enough test, uh, test basis and they didn't do something right. And then they try to redo the study. And so it's all about redoing studies over and over again. Super important. I'll give you more on that later. But um, it, it's interesting to see what studies are dismissed and what studies are accepted and who those studies are done by. Studies cost money. You guys get that? Yeah. Yeah. Studies cost money and the only one, the government's not going to do very many studies unless it benefits them, unless they have money for it in their budget and their budget tends to go to other things. So you have to understand that the, the most studies that are being done are being done by corporations who have a vested interest in it. So that already puts bias onto it. And so you can, you can go through, but you'll notice there's quite a few fallacies. There's quite a few issues that are, that are happening in the argumentation in this. But notice what the other one is, is covering. It's covering corruption in those corporations. And the first one is an argument against all these complaints about GMOs. But the other one is showing how there is a whole bunch of money on the line and people are clearly biased and clearly committing fraud even in trying to make sure that things go through. So remember there's a narrative. There's always a narrative that someone is spinning. They are trying to get you to follow this train of thought, this story. And if you are not paying attention, you might be misled. GMO products might be fine. They also might cause cancer and infertility, and we won't even know for three generations. But what's important to you? Is it making money or is it preserving life? Because not only might they affect us, they are definitely already invading all, the entire world. If we're just talking like the, the environment. So all life on this planet, it has all evolved or adapted together over a long period of time. And we keep making these weird changes that are not natural, that aren't symbiotic, and for a different purpose than making it work together for good. It's making it work together for money. <laughs> and when we do that, we're going to have huge problems. There's going to be a huge problem. And already, like soy crops, uh, you know, like anything, if you have soy, if you have, uh, if you have sugar that's not from cane, uh, if you have corn, if you have beets, well, the, that's the sugar beets is where uh, the, the sugar is for that. But like if you have that, or if you have, let's say, uh, like all of that stuff is going to be genetically modified. And if you think you don't eat that stuff, look in your food. Like look in canned food or candy or anything that has corn syrup in it. Do you think they're using organic corn for that? Or do you think they're using GMO corn? If you just go up onto Google and search major genetically modified crops in the U.S., you'll find like five or six of them. Cotton's another one. Somehow milk is on that list. Why is milk on that list? Is milk genetically modified? Are the cows genetically modified? That's a question, by the way. Not the, not the cows, but like, I'm assuming like the milk itself, like after it, the cows have been milked. Oh, no. Nope. I think they, they feed them uh, GMO corns. There we go. Yeah. Uh, cows 
are being fed, the majority of what they're being fed is GMO corn or, or GMO cotton. <laughs> it's something GMO. By the way, corn as feed for a cow with four compartments to their stomach. Is that what they're supposed to be eating? Should no. they be eating corn? No. No, not really. that's, that's not healthy for a cow. By the way, whatever you feed the things that you eat, you think that that's not going to have an effect on you? So I made this argument before, maybe in this class, maybe in a different one, but a strong argument for why we should eat animals is because they can get nutrients that we can't get. Can you get nutrients from corn? Can you digest corn on your own? Yeah. You can. You don't need your cows to eat corn. You can get that nutrients yourself, and it's not very nutritious. Uh, you need the nutrients from the cow that you can't get, which is in the grasses that they eat, that they're supposed to be eating. The stuff that they eat, where they can process with their four compartment stomachs, like the cellulose, and break it down so they can actually get to those other nutrients. That's what the kind of nutrients that we need. That's why when you see in the stores grass-fed beef, is that expensive? Yeah. It is incredibly expensive. But maybe that's just a gimmick, right? Maybe that's just a gimmick. Hey, the richest and the smartest people and the most powerful people in the world, what do you think they eat? Do, they, do you think they eat normal beef? Or do you think they eat grass-fed beef? Grass-fed beef. Yeah, they do. They do. The, the people who run those companies, I can guarantee you they don't eat their product. Think about this, right? You should not be trusting everything that's told to you. So first, you need to be able to diagnose the arguments that are being put in front of you. Is it an argument of fact, argument of value? What are they using to support the facts? And what other arguments could be made about this? What are some naysayers that could be brought up? Because you, you really need to be thinking more critically about the material. We're going to keep doing this. And I'm going to give you articles that I don't agree with. I'm going to give you articles that you probably should question, uh, not just because I disagree with them, but just because they are, they are saying questionable things. And if you don't catch that, you're not, you're not practicing the critical thinking that we're trying to, we're trying to keep going over and over again. You should be questioning everything. So you got to think about that stuff. And if you have a question about it, maybe you want to go look into it because any of the stuff that I cover, you, you can't use these as sources, but you can use them to get you familiar with a topic. We're covering specific things until the argument of fact essay is due, but maybe one of these topics will trigger something in your head that'll inspire you. You'll be like, you know what? I really want to cover this topic. Either you'll see like an injustice or you'll see something as being like, that's messed up. Or maybe it's something that I've said that you actually disagree with. And you're like, you know what? F that guy. I'm going to argue against that thing he said. And that is totally fine. I won't mark you down for it. I won't mark you down if your argument sucks. It's fine. Some of the arguments I bring up may be my viewpoint. Some of them might not be. The whole point is to question everything that we are covering in this class and everything that you consume pretty much, like consume with your brain, like question it. Don't like question your cereal bowl. It won't answer. It won't answer you back. Kind of like you guys in this class. <laughs> All right. Um, that's enough of me talking trash. So there's quite a few things, right? You can go through. You're going to have to do this with the, with the next one. So I told you not so specifically to use the crap test and the fallacy handout to try and go over these. You will need to do that more specifically with the next homework assignment. So this was just the readings that we're talking about. There's a lot here. And you guys aren't helping me cover it. So I don't want to, I don't want to drag this out anymore. But just know that there's, there's quite a few things in here that when you, when you look at what's happening, a clean record he's saying about GMOs. So we've been selectively breeding crops for millennia. He is correct. Is that the same thing as genetically modifying it? 
Do you know what's happening when we're genetically modifying it? One of those claims earlier was actually false. It makes it so that we have to use less pesticides. Is that true? If that's in this text, if it says we have to use less pesticides with, genetic, with certain genetically modified crops, that is false. What it's doing is it's either putting the pesticides into the DNA of the plant, or it is making it so that the plant can withstand more pesticides without dying. Like understand what they are actually doing because the way that they might word it is completely misleading and you wouldn't even know unless you're more familiar with the topic. So with Roundup Ready Soy, that's the soy product that you're, you guys are eating. By the way, if you have anything that says vegetable oil or partially hydrogenated vegetable oil on the ingredients on whatever thing you're eating, if it says that, which I can guarantee it says it on any candy you eat and on pretty much like any of the canned foods that are not like already organic, if it doesn't say organic and it says it has vegetable oil in it and, or it says soy or whatever, it's guaranteed to be this. So you're eating it in like a ton of stuff. If you don't eat like a rich person, then the chances of you consuming this in almost like every meal are very high in probability. So that or corn through corn syrup, right? So Roundup Ready Soy makes it so that it can withstand it more. Do you understand how problematic that is? That means you're getting more pesticides than ever in your food. So it's not necessarily about the problem about the the GMO itself. It's about what using the GMO does to your intake of pesticides because we can you can guarantee that there are some pesticides out there that are known to already cause cancer. There are chemicals that you're putting in your body that remain in your body. They may not kill you, but they can do things very easily like they can be endocrine disruptors. Do you know what your endocrine system is? Do you know what it does? Hormones. That's your hormones. So do you want your hormones messed up? Let's say you're a guy. You want some estrogen? You want your body to produce more estrogen? Do you know what that would do to you? So this is a, a technique in argumentation. Someone might not care about the environment. You could make an environment argument about GMO products, but let's say someone only cares about themselves, and let's say they really care about their manhood or the way that their body looks. Well, you can make an argument that you're a guy, you want boobs, you want smaller genitalia, because you can get it if you'd like. Can you imagine being raised with this, getting this in the womb, getting it up through your entire childhood during your most developmental period of time in your life? Do you think that might affect you if you're getting more and more estrogen, your body's making it because it's getting weird chemicals that are causing your body to produce it when it, you shouldn't have it at all or you should have much less of it? This is actually real. This isn't hypothetical. This is a real thing. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you want more estrogen. Do you think excessive estrogen is good for women? It's not, if you have an estrogen deficiency, sure, but you can't just eat more soy and it's gonna, there's a thing with, with soy, it's not, it, it creates a synthetic estrogen, but that causes your body to produce more actual estrogen. So it's a little bit more complicated, but it's, it has the same results. So it's important to know about the topic. So any of the claims that you guys were making earlier on, I mean, if you don't know about it, like, yeah, you guys are just working with the information that you have. That's fair. The problem is you're wrong. You, you could be very wrong about a topic. You don't want to be wrong about it. You want to make sure that you're, you have enough information. And this guy was painting a picture that was not accurate. So when he says we've been selectively breeding crops over a long period of time, yeah, like eugenics or something like that, like selectively breeding. So over time, we can see what happens slowly. This is different than the way that we genetically modify things. This is incredibly different. So this is called a fallacy. This is called false analogy because you are comparing two unlike things. 
you're comparing GMO splicing DNA with selective breeding. Completely different. They may look similar, but they are not. Then over here, for some 60 years, scientists have been using mutagenic techniques to scramble DNA of plants with radiation and chemicals, creating you know, strains that are mainstays. And they haven't been complaining about that. Well, is that a good thing? Just because they've been doing something and without complaint, does that mean it's a good thing? Before we trusted scientists blindly, uh, scientists and doctors, so during the periods of time when we, we were blindly believing them, they were doing this stuff, that doesn't make it right. This is called the two wrongs fallacy, where you are saying just because we did this other thing, like you can't justify one wrongdoing with another one. This actually gets a little more complicated than that, but you should start seeing that there are problems in what people are saying. You, you wanna test the other reading out, all you have to do, you guys know how hyperlinks work, right? All you have to do is look, control, and then so. And then I go, and then we get to read the article and you can assess it if you want. You only have to go through a couple points, but pick the best ones. Focus on the most important thing. So you're assessing the information that's being given to you here and you are figuring out, okay, what's the claim of fact that I really want to explore because it's super important to the argument? Damaging products. See, this, this one could be, yeah, it could be good. Um, think, about, think about the claim. Think about what's useful for maybe if you wanted to explore this topic further. And then you can work on these things. And then if you use something, if you, if you write something into a response paper and you feel like it's useful, for, sorry, a, uh, if you write something into a reading response and you feel like it's useful for an essay, like for the essay that you're gonna, you ended up deciding you're gonna write on the same topic, on that same, like this could be an argument in it, you can, you can throw that in there, that's fine. You don't wanna use previous essay material in a newer essay, but if, if you wanna use stuff that you've been building through your response papers, you can go for it. Like that's, that's fair play. So now that you guys have run out of uh, response papers to miss, I have added an extra. So it's not really extra. If you look at the course schedule, so it starts on week five, but you, you should notice that there's actually only 14 reading responses left because of how I had to push everything back. So in order to fix that, this one's not on the course outline but it is right here under week six. So you can go here and do this reading response on this reading. I'm calling it a bonus one so that you guys still have 15 available so that you, you don't miss any. So this is right here. If you have missed three already, then you're gonna need this. But then there's also the fallacy quiz, which I already explained how to do in that other video. So what it comes down to now is Saturday. So for this next Saturday, your homework is to Watch this video. It's entertaining, a lot more entertaining than me, but it, it has some really important information. I'm actually gonna give you another John Oliver one to, to watch for our class discussion on Saturday also. But for the reading response for Saturday, it's gonna be watch that video, then read this article, which is focusing on it. So it takes what he talks about in that video and it develops it out and it, it gives you sources like a bunch. What I want you to do specifically in this reading response is to actually go through some of these. You only need to do a couple, but make sure you pick the right ones. So don't just go over the first one, you know, not these, these don't count. Like start, start here, like fraud in clinical drug trials. That one sounds crazy. Falsified studies. Yeah, that's, that's something. So you can go through these to, to go through the crap test. You need to practice this stuff. Look at her claims, assess her claims and all that. But yeah, th so this is what I'm asking you to do. Make sure hyperlink. So now you can assess this article, the sources that she is using. Yeah, date, but does this date matter for the material? Like maybe that doesn't matter because of what the claim is talking about. If it's talking about the history of some of the things that the FDA has done in recent years, sounds 
fair. Now I'm already doing your work for you. So just understand, hey, guess what? The cool thing about this is you can even go and, and check the hyperlinks in that also. This is not a waste of time. Don't think about your homework as being something that you just need to get through. Spend a little time on it. If you do, then you're going to become more familiar with things that you could write on. And you're also going to practice the skills, like you're going to do the things that you need to do in order to get better at this. And then when you get to the next assignment and the next assignment, it's gonna get easier and easier. So don't look at this as, crap, it's 10 p.m. and it's due at 11.59, I just need to crank through this. Go and look at it earlier. Look at it earlier, spend more time on it so that you can actually figure out things because maybe, maybe it's as important as something you consume. Like your food is possibly poisoning you. Does that sound like something that you earnestly should know about? that you should truly look into to make sure you know what to eat? Because all the rich people, all the people in power are very specific about what they eat. Okay, any questions about that? Because there is something else I wanna show you. Any questions? Everything I've said is just so incredibly clear. I'm just so good at this that you have no questions, huh? All right, so once again, remember we were looking at this we passed up this right here. So news sources. So I want to show you, oh wait, that's, that's not right. Uh, <laughs> that's upside down. Okay, let's try this one. Okay, so what you'll see here is we have a chart, an infographic that I did not create. I didn't create any of these. There's a bunch of them. And maybe they've changed quite a bit because a lot has gone on since, uh, since 2017. So you will see to the left, there's overall quality. Quality and the difference in what is being reported. So the things in this yellow area right here, you'll notice have a lot more opinion and complex analysis, but they're still making claims that aren't just the facts. Stuff up here is more likely to be fact reporting, but there is still, there's still some other factors here. Like if you look at the top, you'll notice uh, media bias. So notice there's stuff on the right and the left. Some are more to the right, some are more to the left, but what I need you to understand is, so I didn't make these charts. If I would have made these charts, no matter which chart I'm looking at. So some of them I would put in different categories or different places. Some I feel are like MSNBC should probably be lower down in quality. Same with uh, Fox News. I don't even see Fox News on here. Down a little bit. Oh, you see it? Yeah. Yeah, right there. Yeah, the well, that's Fox News Daily Wire, so that's oh. a specific one. So you can know. already, isn't this silly? You can even see bias in the way these charts were made, right? A lot of the, um, I haven't seen one of these charts that's made by someone who is more conservative, but you'll see like, like Buzzfeed is up here. <laughs> Buzzfeed shouldn't even be close to this. Uh, yeah, this should be down lower too. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of these that should really be just so much, so much further down in quality and then further apart in further in bias if, if that makes sense this one it's roughly the same too but you guys get how there's there's different sources of each thing so not to drag this out any further just notice that you're going to find a lot more bias than people expect and you're going to find less quality than you would hope for and so that's why you need to be more discerning in the way that you come to articles that you should be able to, articles and resources that you should be able to use for evidence or support or information to be able to come to your own ideas about. Uh, one thing that you should notice, AP, which is, stands for Associated Press, and Reuters here, these are international sources. So, uh, 
Associated Press. It's a nonprofit cooperative of journalists uh, and similar, well, Reuters is also, I mean, there's, there's obviously someone who owns these, but they are supposed to give just the facts and it's international. And these uh, articles from Associated Press and Reuters tend to get picked up by national, by national and local news sources. So it's important that you know, like if you're, if you're gonna find an AP, AP articles and Reuters articles are supposed to be the least biased, most objective sources that you can work with. And I, I would tend to agree, there, there might still be some bias that slips in depending on how they word something, but they go to their best efforts to not, to not let anything slip in. At least when you, we're talking about standards, they're, they're higher up, way higher up. I, I completely agree with where they, they are at least above everyone else. So understand that then other news sources, especially what you will watch as news sources, national, they will take some of these and maybe they'll even just be lazy and they will just change the title. But do you understand how powerful it is just to change the title of something? The title will tell you how to read it. It will give you the slant to read it with, like what to look for and how to interpret the material. Giving something a different title is incredibly powerful. So don't look at that as being benign. It can be incredibly manipulative to change the title of something. So you can see like the same associated press article might be taken up by another, another company. So let's, let's look at an example of this really quick. So I'm telling you some stuff about these, right? So Reuters and associated press articles get picked up by national and local news and they will they tend to focus on those they don't just like cut and paste it but sometimes they will focus on elements that are important to their political stance because all national news sources for some reason now are tending to be biased towards a political party like it's all of them uh some more than others they might do that but then local news Local news does its own reporting too, and you'd be surprised because so national news will pick up local articles also. So I'm going to show you an example, but local articles will tend to focus on what is pertinent, what is important towards the local issue that, that their readership might be interested about with that. So let's say if there's a bombing, they'll say, well, who from our area died in that bombing? So that's an example. So for our next essay, our third essay, don't think about this right now, but our third essay is going to be on freedom of speech. So we're just going to look at an example of something to look at with that. But once again, don't even start trying to think about that. You're not dealing with that right now. We're not going there. Don't get excited. So uh, this article specifically from First Amendment Watch, it's at New York University and it's a project of this journalism institute. So they're really into it. So you'll notice what they posted here about threatening lyrics and music. You can see that there's actually several articles that they either got their information from or that also talk about this. So you can see there's an Associated Press article. There is a Pittsburgh Post Gazette, which is local news article. And then there is a Washington Post article. And so you can see the different ways that they report on it. So there's, there's different focuses. And so this is the uh, local one, and then Washington Post. So they, they might all have a different title, which may give you a different uh, slant in how you are interpreting the material or what is important in, in what happened. So that's something to look at. Uh, but I, I want you to know just like be familiar because eventually there's going to be another project. So we did, we have that fallacy quiz, but then we're also going to have a crap test assignment that's going to be significant. It's going to be a group assignment. I'll give you more information on that later, but just know you're going to have to be able to do this stuff with sources. So make sure you understand what you're working with, with sources and that you can't blindly trust anyone. You have to at least assess the information that's being given to you and explore it a little bit before you just say, sure. Sure, okay. See, so you can see that this person, where's MSNBC? So if, if MSNBC is higher up than Fox News, I mean, it could be a little higher, but yeah, that's way higher. They're both pretty bad. They're both highly biased. So 
it kind of already shows what the person who made this chart thinks. It's still useful, still tells you which slants roughly, like you, you can agree with most of what's said here. Definitely don't use InfoWars, that is garbage. And there is garbage on the other side too, but this one's more famous, so I'm sure you've all heard of InfoWars. Don't use the Inquirer, that is all garbage media. Um, there's tons of garbage media though. So uh, BuzzFeed is garbage media. You guys get it? Does this make sense? Any other questions about this stuff? Yeah, I think we covered it all. You have your marching orders, you know what you need to do. So uh, have a good rest of your weekend.